So I'm going to talk mainly about the findings from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Assessment of Climate Change Impacts, Adaptation Options and Vulnerability with a particular focus on New Zealand, but I'll start off with a quick global overview just to set the broader scene within which New Zealand fits. And my role there was that I was the coordinating lead author for the chapter that covered Australia and New Zealand out of that assessment. And before I get started, I also want to acknowledge um, funding support that I received for this from my employer, the Greenhouse Gas Research Centre, Ag Research, and also the Ministry for the Environment. But needless to say, I'm not speaking on their behalf. Very briefly, before I actually get to the substance, I want to give you a very quick overview of what the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change actually covers and what it does. The IPCC is probably one of the largest and the most comprehensive efforts to uh, condense scientific evidence of a major public policy relevance for any um, area globally. That includes biodiversity, includes ozone depletion, climate change, and the IPCC is probably the most comprehensive effort there. It produces roughly every six to seven years um, comprehensive so-called assessment reports where scientists around the world sift through the published scientific evidence and try and condense it down to what we really know about the world, what we don't know, where areas of consensus lie, where areas of divergence lie, in order to provide a basis for decision making. But the IPCC doesn't provide recommendations on policy. It explicitly gets told off by governments if it tries to do that. It provides the evidence basis based on which governments can then make their decisions, because that's seen as, a, you know, as the domain of governments where science informs that but, but can't determine that. Um, the IPCC produces usually three major working group reports, one covering the physical climate basis, so how much is the climate changing, how much change can we expect in the future. Working group two covers vulnerability, impacts of climate change and adaptation options. And working group three covers mitigation or ways to reduce greenhouse gas emissions to limit the amount of climate change. And then there's also a synth report at the end that tries to pull it all together. And my involvement was mainly in working group two as a coordinating lead author for one of the chapters. But for my sins, I'm also part of the synthesis report. Um, and that work is still ongoing. The, the three working group reports have all been published and are available in full on the internet. Um, and just to give a sense of the, of the magnitude of effort under those reports, um, it took about just over three years to produce the one report by working group two involved 242 lead authors and 66 review editors who are charged with ensuring that the open public peer review process that each chapter has to undergo really takes review comments seriously, which is why it takes three years, because we're not just writing something and that's it. We're writing something, submitting it for public comment by the expert community. We're then required to respond in writing to every single review comment we receive on the report modify the draft accordingly, send it out for review again, that gets commented on again, we have to again respond in writing, and then we're near the final version, including a summary for policymakers, which is basically the executive summary of the report, which then gets submitted to governments and gets approved word by word in an exhausting, grueling plenary session that takes five days and five nights. Um, and I'm not kidding. Um, so just to give you a sense of the review process, so we had one informal review, two formal global expert reviews, and a final government review. The Working Group 2 report received a total of 48,000 comments in those, just the two formal expert reviews, and another 2,350 comments just on the final summary for policymakers. Each one of those 48,142 comments has been responded to by the author team, and there's the review editors who checked that we really have looked at them, which doesn't mean that we have to accept all comments that we receive, which is impossible because you, you quite often get contradictory comments. One says, brilliant, have to keep it exactly that way. So another comment says, oh, far too weak, you really have to strengthen that statement. A third comment says, I'm not quite sure that's justified. And so we have to look at what the comment actually says, why it says it, what, what the evidence basis is, which is the entire job of the assessment, to then make sure that our draft reflects the balance. And if there's a if there are genuinely diverging views, then we have to say so. You know, no conclusive evidence is as yet available on the following. But where the evidence is conclusive, it's our job to say so and to check very hard why people who may disagree with it disagree and whether there's really a good evidence base for it. So that's the exhausting process. And as I say, we're now at the end of the fifth assessment report, but we're still doing the final synthesis, which, which tries to basically put two and two together. So before I get to the findings on climate change impacts, I want to give a, in just one slide, a very potted summary of what we've seen recently in terms of physical climate change. 
That diagram shows you the observed decadal average, global average temperature from 1850 to 2010, basically. And you can see there's been, you know, wobbling initially, an upward trend, short, short cooling or flat phase, and then a very consistent upward trend over the, of the, over the last four decades. So that's just averages over a, a, a time span of 10 years each. You can then also plot the global average temperature on a year-to-year -year basis, which of course is much more noisy because there's natural variability in the global climate system, which is reflected in changing ocean circulation and simply the, the chaotic nature of, 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 of weather spills through into the climate signal on a year-on-year -year basis, which is why climate is generally defined as something that happens over longer time periods. So a single year doesn't tell you anything about the climate, and even a short 10-year period doesn't tell you very much about the sort of trends in the climate system. And there's, I mean, quite a bit of chatter occasionally around, you know, has global warming stopped? And if you look, you know, if you pick that year, and if you pick, you know, those years, then yes, under some temperature records, there hasn't been much warming from exactly that year. But if you, if you look at it in the longer term perspective, it's very much part of a, of a long term upward trend that has you know, periods of very sharp accelerated warming and then flatter periods again. Um, so from an Earth system perspective, there's a very strong continuous warming record, which you also see in the ocean, because that's the other um, sort of global climate signal that's very robust. Um, we now have even satellite-based sea level rise monitoring around the world, so it's no longer contingent on individual tide gauges, which might be affected by land subsidence, etc. And you can see a continuous upward trend in global average sea levels, including over the last 10 years, because actually a more careful analysis reveals that most of the energy over the last 10 years, for reasons that we don't entirely understand yet, went into the ocean rather than into the atmosphere, which is why the atmosphere has warmed less just over the last 10 years, but actually the ocean has warmed more. And you can see this by continued sea level increase because a warming water expands and in a finite ocean basin, the water has only one way to go and that's upwards. Um, so I'll, I'll just leave it at that just as a context. That's, that's work done by working group one on the physical climate, uh, um, climate science evidence. And I'll get back to that when I get to the detailed findings for New Zealand. Um, so now let me move to impacts of climate change. What, what do changes observed and projected into the future mean for vulnerability? W one of the key things from the most recent assessment is the much more widespread evidence of climate change impacts already happening as a result of warming and changing rainfall patterns and rising sea levels. The evidence is still <coughs> strongest in terms of physical climate systems. So date of breakup of river and sea ice, for example, shrinking glaciers, rising snow lines, that, that sort of thing, which is sort of still at the, at the physical end of climate change impacts, which can be very important. I mean, if you think of entire villages built on permafrost in the Arctic region, for them, a change in the physical climate regime related to, to permafrost melt is, is of fundamental importance. So it's not just a trivial part of the physical system that nobody deeply cares about. Um, but it is most easily detected because there's least interference by other trends and drivers from human activities. Another area where we've seen a lot of increasing evidence of, of, of impacts from recent warming trends, but also climatic extremes, is in natural ecosystems. So increased coral reef bleaching, for example, is a, is a, is a key example. Um, impacts of, of repeated wildfires on habitat, change in habitat areas as a result of drying trends. Um, so again, the mounting evidence much more than we had six or seven years ago, which really indicates that what used to be a projection some 10 years ago is actually being observed now in, in, in various areas. And that map gives you an overview from that assessment of observed climate change impacts all around the world. And so the blue things are what you would, might call physical impacts. So that's date of breakup of river ice, for example. Green are ecosystem impacts and radar impacts on human or, or, or sort of managed systems. That's agriculture, that's human health mainly. And the important thing there is that six, six years ago in the previous assessment, we had very, very few instances where we could detect an impact of the observed climate change on human systems. Because basically the signal wasn't strong enough to rise above the noise introduced by ongoing human interactions with the natural environment. But now on every continent we have beginning evidence that actually human pr production systems, food production systems, 
in other instances, human health is already being impacted by the observed warming trend. Another thing that we've noticed over the last sort of 10 years is how exposed and vulnerable we are to climatic extremes, which we can't always say is due to climate change yet because, you know, a single large storm might have happened even in the absence of climate change. But what we're noticing is that both developing and developed countries have shown stunning vulnerability to major flood, ev flood events, major wildfires, um, which Again, I need to emphasize this, doesn't mean this is an impact of climate change, but it does tell us how sensitive we are to changes and extremes that we would expect to occur in future under climate change. It's just much harder to, to say this with confidence on, on individual events. And by and large, we're seeing impact from individual ex events. But if you think of the you know, major floods in 2011 in Australia and Queensland, where I think at some stage 60% of the entire state was underwater, 35 lives were lost, estimated sort of just public sector damages in the order of, I think, five or six billion Australian dollars. So these are, these are massive consequences of, of events happening now. Um, and I'm not going to go into more detail at the global level, but of course the, the simple implication of the picture that's emerging now, both from climate trends and from better understanding of how changing climate interacts to create impacts, is that we of course would expect an increasing magnitude of warming creating more and more impacts, both in terms of changing extreme events, so more heat waves, more wildfires, increased risk of flooding, but also underlying long-term trends that don't always manifest in extremes. With a, at the upper end of, of possible warming by the end of the 21st century, a real potential for, se for very severe and pervasive impacts. But I don't want to take your time on that global sort of scenario I can only refer you to the summary for policymakers, which gives sort of the highest level summary of the global scale impacts. So I, I rather want to move on for some thinking that has happened over the last five to ten years, how we actually conceptualize climate change and its potential impacts from a risk management perspective. I think the academic community is guilty of, you know, five to ten years ago, people might have studied a potential climate change impact on a certain system, picked the year 2100 as the, as the year of interest, you know, say how much crop production in 2100 is going to decline, publish and then expect things to happen. And of course they don't happen, you know. W what do you do with it? You need to link it with, with the sphere of actual decision making, of the actual sphere of influence that individuals and organizations actually have. So things have moved on a lot since then, thankfully, with a much clearer realization that actually risk from climate change is the product of three different elements. One is the changing <coughs> climatic hazard, so changing frequency, intensity of extreme events, for example. Exposure, where are people living? Where are activities occurring that are potentially sensitive to climate change? And what's the vulnerability? How sensitive are they to extremes happening? And you know, one example, the major drought in 2012-13 in New Zealand had a significant impact on our dairy production. We also had quite a significant drought this year in the Waikato but the impact was much less because farmers were much more proactive in, in ensuring that they could purchase additional feed supplementation to keep the production levels up. So, you know, you could argue the hazard was the same. People were still farming in, in, the, in the Waikato, but the vulnerability has changed because they were much more proactive in ensuring, you know, robust su supply chains. So only once you put all those three together do you really understand the, the concept of, of climate change risk, which is the landscape upon which the real world then plays out. Because risk is just the potential for things to happen and then of course, you know, at regular or maybe irregular intervals you then get impacts where, you know, a heat wave does occur, a, f a flood, of flood event does occur, which then feed back, feeds back on the climate and of course on social economic development overall. So with that generic picture, I now want to talk more about findings from the IPCC on Australia and New Zealand. The, the region covered by our chapter is roughly this one, which is you know, a, a sizable part of the globe, but the advantage is that our region only covers two countries, Australia and New Zealand. Um, it doesn't include other countries with, which biogeographically are part of Australasia, like Papua New, New Guinea, which is, I mean, great for us because it's much easier and much, you, know, you, can, you can say much more relevant things about governance dimensions of, of, of adapting to climate change impacts, for example, than if you have to cover other small islands that have a very different development state than Australia and New Zealand have, because Australia and New Zealand, globally speaking, are much more similar than they are different. Um, and, you know, 
take, take pity for the chapter they had to deal with all of Africa or all of Asia. So we, we tried very hard to make, a, make an assessment that really speaks to the, you know, the situation that we're in in our region. So let's get back quickly to physical climate change. The black line is the observed annual average temperature of New Zealand from a, from a range of measurement time series. You can then use global climate models and see if you can reproduce the climate trend. Um, the blue shaded area is what climate models tell you if you assume that greenhouse gases have no additional warming effect. So it's just basically the natural climate variability and you can see, well it sort of covers the, the, the range of natural variability but it doesn't actually reproduce the trend. If you now use the same climate models, that are global climate models, but you can of course interrogate them for what they predict for a certain region, and add the warming effect from greenhouse gases to that, you get a reasonably better match to the observed temperature trend, simply because of additional warming effect from greenhouse gases. You can then take the same climate models and run them into the future under a variety of assumptions about global greenhouse gas emissions. The blue band is the warming over New Zealand that you would expect if the world makes rapid concerted efforts to reduce greenhouse gas emissions down to basically zero carbon dioxide emissions by the end of the 21st century, which globally limits warming reasonably reliably to less than two degrees above pre-industrial levels. Um, and in New Zealand, a little bit less still because we're more buffered by the Southern Ocean, which takes longer to warm up. Um, and the red band is the warming you expect under you know, what I would call an unmitigated disaster scenario where the world continues to increase greenhouse gas emissions due to continued population growth, but also quite inefficient use of, of technologies and basically exhaustion of, well, not even exhaustion, but heavy use of fossil fuel reserves. But of course, average temperature is, is, is sort of the, the most popular, but not, not necessarily the most meaningful um, representation of climate change and it's relevant to impacts. The map shows you projected changes in annual average precipitation, so that's rain and snowfall across New Zealand, by the end of the 21st century, relative to about 1990. And you can see a pattern where typically eastern regions tend to get drier, as well as the northern region, and southwestern regions tend to get wetter. And that's a reflection of a general expected shift in, in westerly rain, um, um, wind flow across New Zealand, which simply enhances the existing orographic rainfall difference, where we have a lot more rain in Fjordland than we have on the, on the east coast, as anybody who went tramping in Fjordland knows um, very well. But it's important to recognize that you know, annual average rainfall isn't necessarily what's going to drive impacts, and there will be seasonal variations as well. Um, and that shows you the range of outcomes for sort of the east and south island, which is a very large sort of region. So you don't actually get a very strong signal in the average in terms of change in rainfall. But, but you can see that there is a difference in some outliers in, 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 in models under a high carbon world, so that's a high emission world compared to a rapidly decarbonizing world. The, the signal is actually quite weak for the region, but I wanted to show you your region basically. The signal is much stronger for other regions where you actually get, expect an increase in rainfall during summer, but a decrease in winter, which f if you're a farmer is, is very important. <coughs> and the annual average rainfall doesn't actually necessarily tell you what you might need to know or what you, what you need to plan for. One of the major implications of the overall rainfall pattern, along with warming, is that we would expect increased runoff in rivers in the south and west of the South Island, but a reduced runoff in the northeast of the South Island and east and north of the North Island, where we, we suspect that the location of headwaters of some rivers could be quite important because you get a lot of rain coming over the Southern Alps and, and then drying off very quickly. Not a fundamental change to what it's now, simply a, you know, a shift in degrees. And so, for example, the Rakaia River, with its headwaters in the, on the main divide, is expected to increase flow. You get more snow melt, more rain falling as rain rather than as snow, and increased rainfall, period. Whereas the Ashley River, further north, but also a little bit further east, is expected to get more of the drying pattern overall because it doesn't catch the, the rain spilling over the main divide. Quite uncertain projections in detail, but the pattern is a very important one that is, has been robust for a whole range of different climate models and different model generations. Another key implication for, for risk management is that we expect an increased drought frequency in many regions of New Zealand. That's a result of drying trends, but also warming trends. Warmer means 
moisture is more quickly lost from soil and therefore you more quickly dry out soil even if the rainfall didn't change. So that map shows modeling by NIWA, by the National Institute of Water and Atmospheric Research. The bottom map is the current drought frequency defined as sort of the, the departure from what's currently considered a dry year. The top map is in, a, in about 2040 under a mid-range climate change scenario. And don't worry too much about the exact numbers, also because they, they, they don't convey the uncertainty that you get from different climate models. But the overall pattern is one of a significant increase in drought risk in many parts of New Zealand, up to a doubling or even tripling of drought frequency over the next three decades. That's a result of both warming trends and drying trends, especially in, in the eastern regions. And, and there, of course, again, seasonal changes are very important um, because you, know, you, you, you get a different combination from a warm winter or from a warm summer. I now want to skip a whole range of detailed issues that we looked at in our assessment, just because I haven't got the time and I don't want to you know, um, make, make things too long for you, but just focus on what we identified as the key risks for the region of Australasia. That's, that's based on you know, potentially major magnitude, potentially um, major importance for particular species, for particular groups of people, potentially economic implications, difficulty in adapting at the extreme end, always keeping in mind that it's from a risk management perspective. This, these are not predictions of what's going to happen, it's trying to lay out the platform which in which, within which we can and have to manage risks, which is of course what we all do in our day jobs basically. We, we try to give a bit more flavor for individual risk in the sense that there are, some risks are different from others. There are some risks based on impacts that are difficult to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to avoid entirely by now simply because of the climate change that's already, if you like, baked into the system. And that's mainly increased bleaching and community change in coral reef systems and montane ecosystems in Australia. There's, there's a limited ad adaptive capacity of some ecosystems and we just don't think we can avoid major changes entirely by now. We can assist them a little bit, you can reduce other stresses, but we can't make them go away anymore. It's too late for that. There's other, other risks which seem to be much more amenable to risk reduction by a combination of mitigation and adaptation. Keeping in mind that le the less the world at, at large reduces emissions, which is what's meant, to, um, meant under mitigation, the more adaptation may have to be transformative, really be quite a substantial change in practice, whereas if climate change is less, just doing more or better of what we're doing already you know, is, a, is a more effective way or can be an effective way of managing those risks. And those risks are flooding, wildfire in both Australia and New Zealand, and pressure on water resource constraints and heat waves in Australia. Um, and finally, a third group of risks covers impacts that are still subject to quite large uncertainties from different climate model realizations, <coughs> where you know things could really go in a whole variety of directions. But from a risk <coughs> management perspective, the fact that we cannot rule out, well, more than just cannot rule out, that there's a you know, substantial potential for quite severe changes makes them a relevant risk. I mean, take as the example, you know, as you might have driven to work in your car today, yes, you put on your seatbelt, even though I'm sure every one of you was quite confident that today you wouldn't crash your car. You know, today? No, today I think I'm going to be fine. And yet I would have felt reckless not wearing a seatbelt. And, and, and so that's, that's that category of, of, of those last few risks where it may not be that bad, but if it were to be really bad, it would be so fundamental that it warrants thinking about right now. And that's widespread damages from sea level rise at the upper end of projected changes and a significant reduction in agriculture production in Australia. Um, and you may notice that I've been careful in pointing out where those risks apply. We looked very hard at which of those risks apply to Australia and New Zealand. Each of those risks applies in, in Australia which ones we can really say hand on heart apply in New Zealand. And we came up with three risks that are really relevant in New Zealand. That's flooding, wildfire, and widespread damages from sea level rise. Which doesn't mean that there are no other issues related to, related to climate change, but we just didn't find enough evidence to say this is a key risk. And it's important not to confuse this. So, you know, uh, just because we don't have evidence of something being a major problem doesn't mean that it isn't a major problem. It's just that our job is to assess the literature 
And based on literature, we cannot say, for example, impacts on natural ecosystems are going to be a major risk for New Zealand. Because the sad truth is we know so little about the relationship of climate change with natural ecosystems that we just can't say this. In Australia, there's a lot more work, and that's why we put it there under montane ecosystems. It might be the case for New Zealand, we just don't know. And we took a conservative approach to identifying key risks by only pointing out those where there's a lot of evidence in the literature that actually says, you know, this is or could be a real challenge that we need to take seriously from a risk management perspective. So very quickly going through those three key risks. One is increase in flood risk. Um, the reason why we identified it as a key risk for New Zealand is, well, first of all, we really have a significant adaptation deficit. Now, flood events that are much less than a statutory required 1 in 50 or 1 in 100 year um, frequency cause substantial damages. Um, so we have catching up to do. We expect a widespread increase in flood risk. That map gives an indication of the increase in 24 hour total rainfall around New Zealand, noting that we would expect an increase in heavy rainfall even in areas where the annual mean rainfall is expected to decrease. So heavy rainfall is mainly brought about by a warmer atmosphere being able to hold more water and therefore being able to dump that water at short notice, which you know is a heavy rainfall event and causes flooding. A average rainfall over the course of a year or so doesn't tell you very much about flood risk. It changes soil moisture conditions and therefore how quickly soils saturate, but that's you know, a smaller part of the equation. And there's a wide range of possible outcomes. The, the upper end of possible outcomes in change in flood risk would pose quite substantial challenges. And I'll give you one example. That's modeling we did for the Hutt River, just north of Wellington, where currently we can plot, that's the black crosses, the current return period of a flood event of that size and the actual magnitude. So right now, the community is aiming to protect the Hutt Valley to a level of 2,300 cubic, cubic meters per second, which currently translates to about a 1 in 440 year event. Now, with climate change under a sort of high emission, that's the unmitigated disaster scenario, we expect the return period of, an, of a flood of that magnitude to reduce substantially to anywhere between about a 25 to 100 year event, which you now leaves the community with two choices. Either you accept the erosion of your, of your desired level of protection against flooding, or you need to increase your flood protection level to basically get back to the same future level of probability of a flood, flood occurring. And if you think of the Hutt Valley as a highly developed urban area, increasing stop banks by that amount is a major challenge, which raises all sorts of questions for how do we manage that? Can we learn to live with risk rather than protect against it? And Judy will cover that. So it's just to flag that that's an example for why flood risk is a key risk for New Zealand. Another issue that we identified is fire risk. Admittedly, that's much more prominent and important in Australia, but there are some issues in New Zealand that are worth thinking about, which is one that native ecosystems in New Zealand aren't well adapted to fire. In Australia, fire is part of how ecosystems function. In New Zealand, that doesn't tend to be the case, and a major fire event doesn't have a rejuvenating, has a, has, a, has a damaging impact. But also interestingly, that of course, significant natural assets that we actually have put there, namely plantation forests, are vulnerable to, to, to you know, increased wildfire under climate change. Um, and just that map shows you a projected increase in the um, seasonal severity rating to wildfire. That's the, that's the map for the current conditions. That's under a mid-range scenario in, in 2040, and that's a mid-range scenario in 2090. Emphasize that's a, an average across climate models for a mid-range emissions, emissions scenario. Outcomes could be above or below that, depending on both greenhouse gas emissions and where the world actually turns out to be. Because once you average models, you always lose the sharp end of the potential impacts, which is not actually terribly helpful from a risk management perspective goes back to the seatbelt wearing example. None of us, I hope, has crashed their car in the last year in a way that required use of a seatbelt. So statistically speaking, seatbelts are a waste of time. But that's not the reason, or that's not a good reason not to wear seatbelts. So it's, it's again, don't lose sight of potential outcomes by averaging models, even though you might feel more safe and secure by using model averages. It's a, it's a real problem for risk management if we do that. Third key risk is um, coastal erosion inundation. 
the, this graph shows a projected increase in global average sea level up to the year 2100. The blue scenario is for a scenario of rapid reduction in greenhouse gas emissions globally. The red scenario is for continued increase in greenhouse gas emissions. So under that assumption, sea level could be you know, about a meter by 2100 above where it's now. Noting that the band is only the, what, what the IPCC calls the likely range. So that's the, that's the area where the IPCC feels there's at least a two-thirds probability that the actual sea level will lie within that band. There's a distinct possibility of, of sea level being higher than that if the Western Antarctic ice sheet misbehaves badly. And there's indications that it might, but just not enough evidence that people that just didn't feel confident to actually try and quantify the additional risk on top of that. That's why they, you know, just that's the likely range. Don't ask me what the, what the upper end is because I can't give you one. You know, the, the, the safe upper end might be up there, which goes back to a risk management approach. What you assume isn't necessarily just what you assume as the, as the sort of best average across um, outcomes. The other thing worth noting is that you notice that the blue band keeps going up. So even a scenario where emissions are reduced to almost zero globally by 2100, where temperature no longer increases, sea level continues to increase because the ocean is still absorbing heat from a warm atmosphere. And of course, glaciers and ice sheets continue to melt in a warmer atmosphere. So it's virtually impossible to stop sea level rise for the next several hundred years. What we can do is influence the rate of rise, noting that you know, if you're at the upper end here, sea level would rise by some 15 to 20 centimeters per decade if you're there, whereas eventually under the blue band it would flatten out and hopefully might even stay below one meter if the world you know, seriously gets its act together in terms of reducing greenhouse gas emission. Another reason why sea level rise is a key risk is that there's, there's a whole range of adaptation options which range from protection, accommodation, so raising minimum floor levels, but at some stage, especially at the upper end, that becomes costly or less feasible. You get groundwater intrusion, you get salinification of, of aquifers, so that eventually managed retreat has to be part of the toolkit as you get to the upper end of projected changes. Um, and the challenge is that that takes a long time, and Judy will talk more about the process that, that, that could be used for that, which is not to say that it's the only solution, but it has to be part of the mental toolkit, keeping in mind the fact that sea level might be up there, and you could you know, take a negative view and say, well, especially given the lack of progress made so far in reducing greenhouse gas emissions. That's a modeling study that we did with NEWA for Auckland, where they modeled inundation. That's just inundation, nothing to do with erosion, which would come on top of that, under different amounts of sea level rise in one of the most you know, highly valued suburbs of, of Auckland, which gives you a sense of the you know, of the, the, the challenge on dealing with that because people aren't going to give up those houses easily. And, you know, you could argue they shouldn't. You know, they're high-value assets. Why would you give them up? But that then means you raise the seawall and you lose the beach. That actually is an important part of the amenity feature of the, of the area. Um, and so just quickly, something that I gleaned from studies for, the, for Otago and Dunedin. Um, one thing to note is that currently the difference in, in high, high water levels for a two and a 100 year storm surge is about 32 centimeters. And the difference between a 20 and 500 year high sea level event is about 25 centimeters. So, and you know, I've just gleaned this quickly. This is not part of our assessment. So, you know, staff may want to correct me if I got this wrong. But if true, the implication is that, I mean, by 2050, you can, you know, safely expect something around 30 centimeters sea level rise. So under that mid range scenario, by 2050, what's currently a 100-year event will become almost an annual event because you're just taking away the 32 centimeters that currently exist between the two. And a currently very rare once in 500 years event might occur sort of roughly every 20 years. So that gives you a sense of the, of the scale for how current protection levels and the ways that we plan for rare events might be impacted by climate change. And I mean, 30 centimeters is an extremely safe assumption for sea level. You know, it'd be It'd be, it'd be quite surprising if sea level didn't get to 30 centimeters at least by 2100. But if, I mean, if you go back to the um, to that plan, so 2050, you know, 30 centimeters is about there. Yes, it could be there, but it might be there by then. 
you're very hard pressed to be below 30 centimeters. And you know, that's just a recent Tonkin and Taylor study about the dune to toe retreat under different sea level rise assumptions. And note that you know, those don't contain time frames because you know, it goes back to you know, having a plan A and a plan B rather than having a prediction for what's going to happen on the 1st of January 2098 um, because you, you can't give that answer basically. So that's my, my jolly summary of the, of sort of the, the problem side. Um, Does anyone have any questions? Yeah, one, of the, um, one of the earlier slides right here at the beginning showed the sea level rise for the last since 1900. Do you have, or is it possible in science, and I, I, it may be impossible to do, but do we have any accurate data so over the last thousand years? I, I mean, I realise you can't know exactly what yeah. it was in 1663, but do we know if that trend is the much difference in the last thousand years? Um, it, it has been different in the sense that it hasn't been, well, I mean, first of all, we don't have accurate data because, I mean, once you go beyond certain, I mean, the longest lived tide gauges go back to about 1700 in some locations. But of course, the problem is that, you know, you, you, tide gauges measure relative sea level rise compared to what the land does. And as cities develop, some, some cities sink, other continental plates rise up. So, that, so the sea level measured by any individual tide gauge tells you what happened in terms of relative sea level, doesn't tell you global average sea level rise. As we have more and more tide gauges around the world, largely during the 20th century, we get an increasingly robust picture of global sea level rise. And also because people have actually tried more actively to correct for any local land movement. And then for the last 20 odd years, we now have satellite based data, which gives you for the first time completely global coverage that's independent of land movement. It's just basically really can measure from satellites how, how far below is the sea below me. What gives us confidence in the assessment for the 20th century is that the, sea, that the satellite based data and the collected tide gauge data for the last 20 odd years agree quite well. So there's a, there's a, there's a reasonably high confidence back to mid, mid 19th century roughly. Going back further below that you have to sort of infer from sediment layers and how high did waves wash up the land that then changes sort of mud deposition, etc., which is much harder to, to get an accurate number out of. Based on that, we would say that sea level has, has, has tended to rise globally, but at a much slower rate. So there's been a, a distinct acceleration over the 20th century. And that acceleration is expected to, can, to continue as the warming effect kicks in. Much of the very, very slow sea level rise increase is still that the world, you know, if you're an ice sheet, you're still coming out of the last ice age, even though that's 10,000 years ago, because ice sheets are quite inert things. But it's a, it's a much slower, slower rate. I'm, I'm, I may have a slide there, but I don't want to sort of, sort of confuse you too much. But I, I mean, we can bring it up later again. Now, the, 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 there are figures in the IPCC report, and I'm you know, happy to go back to it if, you want, if you're looking for you know, an assessment that actually tries to visualize that. I haven't seen anything. I was actually just trying to work out whether at any stage in perhaps the last thousand years we knew that sea level had been higher than say it currently is. Has it gone up and down? No, there's, I'm, I'm not aware of any evidence that would suggest that. It's just that, you know, if you want to, I mean, and the thing is sea level does, can't change overnight. You know, you can only change sea level if you have either warmer water or more water if you want higher sea level. And so it's, it's sort of be, it's unlikely that you have a high sea level for a few years and then it comes down again because the water would have had to come from somewhere. And based on the evidence that we have, there's no evidence that sea level has been sort of sustained higher or even as high as it is today any time over the last thousand years as far as I know. And going back further still. You, you mentioned averages as, as a blunt instrument. And, um, just understanding, and I've, I'm still I'm really struggling with this, but if the average of, say, 30 centimetres rise by 2050, mm. how different can that be in even a place like Dunedin? Because I, I understand it, it, some places will be lower and some will be higher. Like yeah, um, but, but basically, I mean, you, you have to look at the, at the tectonics of the place of interest. And I mean, we have four long running tide gauges around New Zealand, and that's in Auckland, Littleton, um, Dunedin. What's the fourth one? Tauranga? I think so. Um, so don't, you know, don't 
uh, hang me for not knowing the fourth one. Um, and and the, so the, the New Zealand average rise based on the tight gauge data are quite consistent with the global average. So what you can then do is look into the future. We don't have major ice sheets to lose from New Zealand. So we don't expect a, sort of a, a significant land uplifting in contrast to, for example, Greenland is expected to rise because it gets lighter. There's less ice sitting on top of the bedrock. So in some places, ice sheet melting does make a significant difference in New Zealand. <laughs> yeah, like both of them. Um, whereas in New Zealand, we don't expect that. Um, you can then look at change in ocean circulation, which also influences regional sea level rise. And there you just have to rely on a whole suite of models that, tr that, that try to look in into that. Based on that, there's an indication that New Zealand sea levels might be 5 to 10% above the global average, which, I mean, depending on your persuasion, isn't actually the main problem because once you're at one meter, whether it's a meter or meter five or meter 10, isn't going to be the thing that kills you. Um, but it's a potentially non-trivial you know, additional quantity. But I have to emphasize that you know, modeling change in ocean circulation the level of agreement between models is only moderate in many parts of the world. So th the short answer is, yes, you need to look at it, but you know, the, the more sea level rise you get, the more th the signal from global average sea level rise is likely to swamp any local trends in land subsidence or, or land elevation. And you, make the, you use the term flooding. I was describing the impact, I suppose, of increasing climatic change and rain regimes. Um, presumably those models are also applicable to stormwater control management. A city like Dunedin, we control some of the, uh, the rivers, but we've got a large stormwater network. When we think about South Dunedin with uh, sea level rise and increasing stormwater views. So I'm assuming that those predictions will apply equally around those routine periods. Are they doing that rainfall as opposed to flooding in those networks? I mean, basically, it, it, it depends what's actually been done. The, the only robust thing that we have is expectation of increased heavy rainfall events. W whether and how much that translates into increased flooding depends very much on the location. And, and so, it depend, uh, so, for example, we did this, this work for the Hutt River catchment. But an, an important limitation there is that we assumed no major land use change in the upper reaches of the Hutt River catchment. If you did a major deforestation act, that would probably change flood risk downstream more than the, than the change in heavy rainfall. And likewise, if you have a, you know, an aging stormwater system or you know, continued blocking of, 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 of major stormwater pressure points, that you know, can have a, a, a very major impact. But equally, you know, cleaning up those pressure points may be a very effective adaptation option without having to change the stormwater system itself. But it, usually the devil is in the detail. And, and I mean, for the IPCC, we tend to try and use literature that's published in, in peer-reviewed academic journals and some sort of technical reports done for councils that have sort of undergone a demonstrable scientific peer review where we often we only go so far in assessing what we know at the local scale um, but also partially because it's not always clear what assumption was made or it ends up at a, at a council report where I'm sure there were more thoughts about climate change but it's no longer sort of transparently obvious in, in the way it's been published so that's very much providing the basis for which that councils can then use to do their own assessment of risks. So the, the key part from the IPC is just to you know, take risks seriously as a framing rather than a predicted impact and don't rely on model average. And I really have to sort of criticize myself as part of the science community that we've tended to give people model averages, partially because it's more robust, if you like. It's more likely to stand up in environment court when challenged, but it doesn't tell you how to manage risks and what the risk profile is. And only once you've understood them can you then make the decision, that's fine, we'll take that on the chin, you know. Might be okay, so let's not worry about it. Or you, or you decide, this is an unacceptable level, level of risk. Probability may be only 1%, but I'm not prepared to wear that risk. You can only have the intelligent conversation if you actually looked at the range of possible outcomes, whereas if you leave it to climate scientists to collapse the possibilities for you in advance, you'll never get to have that conversation. And that's a major challenge for how we manage risks, I think. In, in, in relation to climate change. We can set up what's possible, but it actually takes many players to make it happen. And it's not just a city council, it's a regional council, it's a central government, and it's the communities. 
So it's actually something that has to take all of those. So what I'm going to talk about a little bit to start with is who the actors are and how they can be leveraged. So hopefully we want a picture like the right, but we all know that the world's messy and we don't have, hold hands always with the right people. Um, local government has clearly got the mandate, and I'll come to that in a minute, but the mandate's particularly fragmented in New Zealand across different parts of the puzzle. Each local government um, unit has similar, not the same always, but similar uh, mandates. Central go government has mandates, some of which is above the radar, but a lot of which is under the radar, and often um, not necessarily, um, uh, what, what, what shall I say, not, not necessarily um, helping the way in which local government can operate with its levers, which brings back the point that you're all dependent on each other. And so um, we also have the professional groups that are servicing councils use very different discourses. Um, for example, the legal fraternity works off a certainty model about providing certainty through legal processes, um, predictability, and therefore this pressure to um, on numbers, like a mean, for example, that Andy was talking about. Um, engineers use a risk management approach, but not necessarily a risk management approach that considers all the uncertainties, as Andy was explaining about the um, uncertainty ranges become very important from a risk management perspective. And the planners are not necessarily always plugged into what risk means in a spatial sense um, on the ground. And importantly, the disaster risk reduction community is not always linked into um, one of its R's, um, which is about risk reduction. Um, very good at recovery, responding in the first instance, but not always in linking in with the spatial planners, for example. So we're not well connected. Now, adaptation is, effect is effectively a bit of a balancing act. We, we can start um, to adapt to future climate change um, in reducing vulnerability and exposure to the present climate variability, which Andy um, also said, and I'll just re-emphasise that. We've got this current variability that we're dealing with and, and some of the um, things that we do in, our, in the councils are not necessarily adapted to that. Um, and I'm not, I'm not entirely sure of all the Dunedin um, stormwater management um, areas, but certainly in Auckland there is a very large deficit in terms of um, the impacts of, of current climate on um, low-lying areas, um, particularly if you take Mission Bay, when you get a good um, high storm surge coming in and also high rainfall, there are significant issues well before you get anywhere near a metre of sea level rise. So this is happening already. But some of the near-term responses that we take to reduce climate-related risks may limit our future choices. And an obvious example would be um, continuing to add height to a seawall or, or a stop bank, um, which will have a limit as to its robustness in terms of breach and also its um, the affordability. And so this can, in a, in a sense, lock in our dependence on getting further um, protection and that's an expectation of communities. We, as well as the, um, the work that Andy showed on the, in the Hutt Valley, we undertook a survey of the Waifetu area. I don't know if any of you know the Wellington area, a small stream that comes into the mouth of the Hutt River, um, which floods periodically and quite significant damage to um, a, a largely um, medium to low income housing area. Um, and the sort of expectations of those people who get regular environmental feedback about flooding, so they know about flooding, but their expectation is that they will continue to be protected. And so that's one of the barriers, in a sense, of making change um, as climate changes. So what we've been, um, some of the thinking, that this is coming from the international literature, which was peer reviewed through the IPCC process that Andy outlined is this notion of thinking about pathways, thinking about where you might go in the future, and if you like, working backwards from that. And so this is the normal sort of decision cycle, which all of you will accept doesn't, isn't what happens in, real, in the real world. It isn't a perfect sort of circle. 
of identifying impacts, adapting, deciding on what are the best ways of going, and then um, selecting something and then reassessing it as you go through, go through the process. Because you're actually working with communities. Um, and so one of the ways that we've been thinking about this, and this comes straight from the IPCC, this diagram, is that we frame and scope and resource things, but most of what we do in adaptation has a, has a lead time. You have research, you have to consult, you have to revise, you have to um, work with community perceptions, you have to work with the reactions of communities to what you're proposing. Um, there are special interest pressures on you. Um, government might be saying something different from what you are. That creates problems. Um, there, are, there are regulatory processes and, of course, there are funding issues um, where the rubber hits the road, obviously, for you managing your organisations. And so all these pressures are on you in terms of making decisions, and then you've got the other component is that the consequences are sometime in the future. So we've got this distant threat, and the psychological research tells us that when people, people discount the future, they're not thinking about something that might happen, they might respond to the fact that they're living in an area that has a known hazard, but we're talking here about something that people haven't experienced before and we can't exactly undertake experiments to understand it. So it's materially different in some respects from how we're, how we're currently planning. And so this sort of schematic has been developed which talks about trying to keep your options open as you go through the future so that you can flexibly manage things. And if you, take a, um, if you take a decision point here, you might continue to top up your stock banks and your seawalls to this point. And then you think, oh, OK, we'll continue to do it. But you very quickly end up in a maladaptive space. In other words, you're increasing expectations of protection and future costs without necessarily dealing with what I call the residual risk, which is the risk if the stock banks breach the damages that would occur um, if the, um, you know, if, if the um, frequency of storms increases um, or rainfall increases, and you can't act, that isn't actually an effective mechanism for dealing with the change. So you might back here think, well, okay, what are the options? And you might say, well, okay, um, we'll provide a bigger footprint for your seawall, which I know you've done in this area. But that might only take you to another point where you need to make a decision. And that decision might be to continue that option, continue to widen your seawall, bottom of your seawall. And that's going to also end you, end you up here, into, a, into this maladaptive space. So you might at this point think, well, OK, this is getting serious. What do we do? What are our range of options? Um, and we might decide to um, move, move our transport network change our transport network or change, change the way we design our stormwater or move some houses that are flooded, potential flooded. So that would take us into here and so forth as we go through time. So this is sort of a conceptual way of thinking about what those um, future options might be. And this, this, interestingly enough, has been adopted by the Delta Commission in the Netherlands and is an integral part of their planning um, for maintaining the integrity of the... Um, the very extensive dikes and pumps and so forth. They, they have far more limited um, options than a country like New Zealand um, because of over a third of their country is underwater. So just to think about this in a slightly different way, we can be incremental in what we do and go along and just do better or more of what we're doing now, which will be quite okay for some things, but there will be some things where there will be limitations and those will be physical ones and affordability ones. Um, yeah, so th there are, there are um, cost limits to um, structural works over long time, time frames and um, there are also physical um, limitations to how wide you can put a footprint or how much rock you can use to batter your, your stock banks, for example. And also this runs the risk of locking in your current um, exposure to risk, which when and if the stock banks might burst or erode or tunnel or whatever they do to, to fall apart in extremely um, high rainfall events, for example. 
there are extremely high costs in the, in, in the future. So where the international discussion is going is thinking about and calling it a label which is transformational change. In other words, thinking a bit outside the square to accept that something has to give and we reassess the objectives here and potentially change course, which is like getting to those decision nodes that I had on the previous slide. And so some of the options that you can look at is to balance your protection um, that you're currently using with some form of accommodation, which could be raising floor levels, and I'm sure you do that in this region already. I know Wellington area does it, um, Auckland does it, a number of regions do. But also to consider where retreat might be um, an option. And of course, thinking like that, immediately you think, well, we've never done it before, although there, have been a, there is one example in this region that was done before in Kelso, some of you will know. Um, but, it, but that was done after many, many, many floods, so it wasn't an anticipated um, retreat. It was something done after da a considerable damage had, been, had occurred um, in the Clutha River, I think. Clutha River. Um, so there have been other examples where retreat has occurred in the twin streams in Auckland, some of you may know, um, in the, the old Waitakere area, where um, they were fortunate in having a fund which could fund um, a lot of community activities, um, creating new spaces for recreation and also um, increasing the biodiversity in the stream and the stream health, as well as removing houses that were flood prone. Um, but that required money and that required a, a fund which they had by virtue of um, governance history in the area. Um, then, you know, there, there are things like looking strategically at where you might relocate areas that are at risk. And um, also, mo most importantly, really balancing the community social objectives and values, um, as well as the economic and environmental ones. However, it needs coordination across decision makers. And there will be um, people who gain and people who lose, and there will be people who are more vulnerable affected than others. And it, it, it actually takes a long time to build that stable consensus, which takes leadership and political will. Very important. Um, so it's really all of us, everybody, um, in this game. Now, at the risk of um, teaching you how to suck eggs, um, I'm just going to run through the framework within which you, you, you operate. Because there are some important levers, um, some of which are not currently being used to do adaptation. Um, central government has um, a statutory New Zealand coastal policy statement, which I'm sure most of you will know, um, which has recently been given um, a shot in the arm, a good shot in the arm, through the um, uh, King Salmon decision in the Supreme Court, which some of you may be aware of, um, which basically says that the uh, New Zealand coastal policy statement is your top of the cascade, which sets the rules effectively for implementation at regional and then subsequently at district level. Um, it's not something that you reinterpret at the district level. It's something that's been determined through the production and the process of developing the New Zealand coastal state policy statement. I'll come back to that because it has actually is extremely useful for dealing with this um, particular issue. Central government is providing guidance and um, it also provides significant research funding. And it has provided guidance that also considers the changing nature of the climate risk. But on good authority from talking to a lot of local body people over New Zealand, it is extremely difficult to implement because the framework within which you're, do you're operating is one where you need certainty. And so there is an enormous um, incentive to provide mean information rather than a range with where the extremes are identified, as Andy was explaining. We, we also have, of course, the regional unitary um, of, of councils um, operating their regional policies and plans. And uh, some of you will be aware that the re a regional rule has to be given effect by a district council. And most regional councils in New Zealand, and I think there's only one that I'm aware of, which is the Canterbury Regional Council, who have actually used that provision um, to, inf to enforce, if you like, implementation by a district council. 
It's something you don't do lightly, it's something that you'd have to do together, and where there is some consensus that it's useful. But there are many court decisions where it has been noted that had there been a regional rule, building and subdivision may not have been allowed. And there, there's even been, um, well, no, I won't go there. There's a, I was thinking of a particular, uh, there was a case quite recently, a Mahanga um, case up in the uh, East Cape area, um, where development has been allowed even with regional rules <laughs> in a hazard zone, um, which is interesting. So the, the district councils at, at the level of the, the city council um, you're operating, if you like, under a framework which has some gaps in it. And those gaps are things that other parties have not necessarily chosen to exercise. Central government only has the coastal policy statement relevant in this area. Um, it doesn't have a flood or a hazards policy statement. Um, and it, it, um, the regional councils and some parts around, around New Zealand don't have regional rules, which could be actually really effective and quite useful for you. Um, and take a bit of heat off. Um, so the heat's shared, shall we say, <laughs> rather than, rather than um, falling just on, um, just on the district councils, which is really where the rubber's hitting the road around the country at the moment. So I just sort of put this up, just <coughs> partly to remind you that there, there are a plethora of le le there's a plethora of <coughs> legislation, um, and they're all not necessarily aligned. Um, and, but more importantly, the very first um, part of the, the, the top circle, this top circle here, this is your mandate around climate change, a requirement to consider the effects of climate change in section 7i of the Resource Management Act in the principles um, section, which is your top part of the cascade as you work through the rest of the, the legislation. But there's also some other useful things in there about, of course, avoiding and mitigating natural hazards, sustainable management. In other words, if you get your decision right down the track, is it sustainable? Come back to the principles of the Act. Um, and it also deals with cumulative effect of these low probably, probability high consequence events. Um, that that is, has been in the Act since 1991. And the re reasonably foreseeable needs of future generations. So there's there's quite a few levers within the RM Act um, sheeting back your decisions to the principles. These are all sitting in the principles of the Act. And being a principle-driven piece of legislation, which has recently been confirmed in the King Salmon decision, this is actually giving, that decision gives you quite a useful um, lever. And of course you've got your other instruments over here, um, which you're all familiar with, and the, if the Local Government Act changes go through that are sitting in the House at the moment, being reported back from the Select Committee, you'll have a 30-year infra, um, infrastructure plan requirement, which is also a good sign, although I would suggest, mo I think most of you do longer than 30 years actually already. I know Auckland's doing 50 in their new plan. And of course you've got this, this creature here, um, which was never included totally in the review of the Resource Management Act in 1991. There was a plan to have that happen and it was never completed. Um, and so this sits out here a little bit stranded in the sense that it's operated at a different level of government and it's not well linked in with the decisions that you take um, around land use planning. And of course this Civil Defence and Emergency Act, um, which also isn't particularly well linked in in terms of the reduction of risk the lifelines groups, I understand, are doing some work around this, um, but there are some gaps in the legislation about how that's done. Also, the Building Act and the Building Code. Um, defaulting to the Building Code will not arise at a, um, a risk management approach. Um, and, in, and in any case, the Building Code is dealing with functional performance of a building. It's not actually dealing with the um, locality of where the building is like uh, is sited, so it's a it's a slightly it, it's down the track in the decision process. Now, just quickly on the coastal policy statement, again, I've just picked out here some of the things in the statement which particularly are useful for dealing with the uncertainty, particularly around sea level rise, um, as Andy had, had outlined. 
it, it, it does have a long time frame, out to 100 years. It, it's basically underpinned by a precautionary approach. Um, and the last two bullet points are, are really interesting because hard protection structures are discouraged in the, um, with, with some small caveats, but nevertheless, it's an important signal. And I think also the other important signal is this transition mechanisms and timeframes which in a way anticipates what I was talking about earlier, um, about transitioning from the current sort of business as usual incremental approach to something a little bit different. Um, and so that, take, that potentially enables you to take time frames into account. Now, I put this up purely to compare what came out of the um, IPCC Working Group 1 report last year and comparing it with what is in the current Ministry to the Environment guidelines um, that you're operating under. And they're basically now out of date, and we are assured that they are going to be updated, although we haven't heard a timeline yet. Um, and if you look at the figures, the upper end of the likely sea level rise is now, as Andy indicated, at least 100 metres. What did I say? One. Sorry, 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 sorry. <laughs> One meter. I was looking at the next line. One meter by 2100, and that the upper rate, upper end rate of rise at 2100 is now 15 to 20 centimeters per decade, um, compared with this, um, the, the figures that were in there previously. And as Andy also said on his diagram with the sea level rise, is that there's still a, a, a chance of being outside that range. <coughs> But I would contend that you don't actually need to wait around till you think there's going to be 100 metres, because if you just think about the effect of storm surge on top of a 10 or 20 or 30 centimetre rise in sea level, I mean, you can think of all sorts of problems of, of, of what, what, what could potentially happen. Um, your, your storm waters will go out to the sea, they're all affected, your low-lying areas affected, groundwater rising as sea level rises, in South Dunedin, you've got even more problems than you currently have. I mean, you know, and the story goes on. Now, one, one of the things that we've been playing around with is thinking about the different timelines that we operate under. And I've put in this um, diagram, which is, of course, pinched from somewhere else, but it, it's adapted to the sort of New Zealand um, um, situation. Our decision cycles are short. But... Our planning instruments are long, well, medium, medium long. And the things that we're deciding about are going to be around for even longer. So we've immediately got a mismatch between what, what we are making decisions about, like the moment you build a house in, a, in an urban area, that's going to be an urban area, and it will be there, as we know, for hundreds of years. So it, it, it's long-term stuff, and the infrastructure as well. And so... What's quite important is to think about what sort of decisions are going to be around for a long time and think about the, in other words, the lifetime of that decision but also the lead time it takes to make a decision about that. Now, I hope this works. <laughs> if, if you take, for example, just an arbitrary um, policy threshold of, say, 50 centimetres of sea level rise and want to look at the effect of doing something about how that might affect things. So that's your first decision point. The second one is you, you are constantly updating these, so they're changing. Now you've got a lead, lead time for the planning and construction of the response, which brings you near to time. So this is working backwards from the future. And the time for the decision, taking account of the uncertainty, and that could be all your community conversations, um, etc. Trying to work out what's acceptable risk for the future. And then, you, before that, you, you would have had to have worked out what some of those options were. So this is just a way of thinking about the problem around the time frames of how long something would be um, that you're making a decision on is going to be around. And then, secondly, um, what's the process leading up to having to make that decision out in the future, which may be, you know, 2040, it may be 2060. 
But whichever decision you, point you're going to choose, there's a hell of a lead time going into that before, um, before those decisions are actually finally implemented. So what I've done here is just a fairly crude um, illustration of what sort of areas might be exposed, from what, what the options might be and how it might be implemented. And forgive me if you've already done this because I suspect some of you have. <laughs> um, all of the ones in the left hand column are things that are exposed currently to changes in climate change, changes in, in um, the sorts of impacts that I've got in the next column from sea level rise, rising groundwater, liquefaction risk, which will interact with gro rising groundwater and sea level, um, and flooding, both surface flooding and river flooding. Um, and I'm just looking at those particular ones, I'm not going, going to look at the um, fire scenarios, which obviously have impact in this particular area as well, because you've got major forests, um, which are sources of income for the council, I, I think they are still. <laughs> um, and so those will be at risk as well. And now the sorts of options you've got are you can protect, which are stop banks, seawalls, barrages, that sort of thing. You can accommodate it through building design or ra you know, raise floor levels and raising services so they're less susceptible. Or you can retreat and place planning limits and, um, or you can manage that, basically managing that over time. And that's one of the things that would be a, um, something you would anticipate could happen in the future in which you could plan, start planning as to how you're going to do that um, today. And so on the implementation side, I've just put down here some of the ways in which we can do that. We can take an, an adaptive management approach. In other words, you, you like that pathways diagram. You can decide to, um, you can decide that the, um, you will adapt your seawalls for a while you might put an, a, a, a time limit on that, which is discussed with the community around what's acceptable. Um, you can stage consents over time through monitoring and coming back and saying, well, okay, is that okay or is that not okay? Will we go down a different path or another path, etc." We can introduce um, conditional consents um, or, or timelines on consents, um, or we can think completely differently and think outside the square and um, how could designers and architectural designers, for example, help us in managing our communities that live near the water's edge, for example. Um, and there are many of these sorts of options being looked at in Europe at the moment. But none of that can happen unless we do a number of things. And the enablers um, that I've got here are that we have to be monitoring those decisions over time we need to be thinking about the sort of policy triggers that we might use. For example, a policy trigger might be um, when people on the leaf get their feet wet, for example. And so far they haven't, but it's a high risk catchment. Let's think about the future. Would the leaf flood and who would be affected? Um, but we need to monitor that. And what's the impact? and what's the impact of how our district plan is, is um, allowing those people to continue to live really right close to the leaf. And I just use that as an uh, example. Um, but probably the two most important things that we currently don't have in spades in, in this country is good coordinated governance across the three levels of government. We have patchiness, we have, we have examples all around the country of territorial local authorities trying out to deal with coastal situations and basically failing. And they're failing because communities are not ready, they're not socialised into thinking about future risk. And so that's probably one of the biggest gaps that's occurring and also coordination between different levels of government. And you know, this area might be fine, but there are other incidences where regional and district councils don't always follow similar paths might, you know, in other words, mixed messages coming from different levels. And also thinking long term about funding. Um, as I said before, Waitakere had a fund that it could call from to actually deal with a particular issue they had in a smallish area. Um, and so, so use of funding mechanisms to, um, 
to enable, give you the flexibility in the future for considering um, the climate risk and, and a range of different options that might be far more transformational than what we're currently doing, like moving people, um, which will be highly contentious and very difficult. So the work we've been doing has really come to the conclusion that our legal framework contains some really useful principles, but our practice is not all that flash. And our practice is pretty much based on static response measures, hazard lines on maps, seawalls, stock banks, that sort of stuff. And that, that will continue to lock in investment and limit our future options um, and have affordability and physical limits, as I've, I've outlined. Also, our economic assessment tools have some problems um, because they're snapshots in time which discount future risk and lock us into protection mode and reduce our flexibility in the future. Now, this is actually a very fertile research area in Europe and the States at the moment where the economists have suddenly realised that, that there's a bit of an issue and that economics doesn't <coughs> deal with future uncertainty over long time frames. Um, and a number of jurisdictions have been trying to develop other ways of um, doing, uh, looking at um, how you assess risks. Some of it are like multi-criteria analyses, which are used in New Zealand, particularly in the stormwater assets area, quite widely, but those sorts of methods um, are very subject to the people, the particular individuals that will do them because they're based on value judgments. And so whenever you set up those sorts of assessment processes, we have to be really careful to be explicit about what the value judgments are that we're putting into the, um, the black box, so to speak. Um, and there are other ways of, of dealing with this that are developing, and those, that information will continue to become available to, um, uh, to local governments through our sorts of research that we're doing. So the decision-making framework, um, you have the mandate, um, there's a question, in my view, over whether, uh, whether there is legitimacy, and by that I mean whether the communities accept that mandate, and that's coming up, like Kapiti, you'll all be familiar what's been happening up in Kapiti recently, uh, north of Wellington, uh, where the council um, did what every council was required to do, um, but it fell flat on the community because the community didn't, did, did, was not socialised into thinking about how to deal with the changing risk, even though that risk has been there my whole career <laughs> and before. <laughs> um, so this is one of the issues, because not only um, is the climate changing, people are changing. Everything's changing. So the social and economic environment within which you're working is changing. So this is actually quite hard stuff. So it's not a criticism. So I think what, what really are my take home message is that the things that will underpin what local government are doing in this area will, will rest and fall on how well the community is socialised to deal with future risk. And seatbelt analogies help, help, thanks Andy. That sort of thinking about dealing with that long term uncertainty. So rather than, rather than um, debating whether the science is right, Finding ways to deal with uncertainty is actually a, a, a better way of conducting the conversation. In terms of who's affected, you don't need to do it all now, some things are more important to be dealing with now, some things might be more important to deal with in 10 years, 20 years time. And also thinking about what's at stake, and importantly thinking about who pays when and the options um, without locking in risk and future costs. So this is just a list of questions that might be useful for thinking about it. I'm nearly finished. Um, which is, what are the first issues we'll face as a result of climate change? And how long will the current strategies that we have now be affected? In other words, what's the use by date? What's the use by date of a stock bank on the lease, for example? When will alternative strategies therefore be needed? And what are the decision pathways that can be taken? And importantly, how robust are the options you're looking at over a range of future scenarios? So that you're not just looking at the mean, you're looking at the extremes as well. So 
the, the critical question behind that is, are we able to change our path easily in the future with minimum disruption and cost? Okay, just a sort of slightly different way of, of a take on it. So that effectively disaggregates your problem down to the things that are most at risk and which require the longest lead time to address. And using this pathways um, approach is a useful way of thinking about it. So there are many pathways to the future. Some will require course corrections and others will become redundant. This is just a summary of decisions will be determined by the lead time, the consequence time, the regulatory and social influences, societal values, expectations and goals, political will and leadership. And most importantly, it has to be a collective process with three levels of government and communities dealing with this in a conversation. Um, so hopefully that is a snapshot of a way of thinking about the problem that could help the processes that you're, you're dealing with as a result of this. So thanks very much. A slide which was some um, adequacy of tools, and you mentioned that there are some useful legal principles that uh, empower uh, local government or any, any sector of government for that matter. In your research though, did you find that, I mean, you, you pointed out that there needed to be a co collective action. Did you find or identify a lack of legal mechanisms? It's one thing to have the principles. Yeah. Uh, for instance, did you identify that if there were more independent discretion given to one sector of government, it would be helpful or not? Or are, we, are you saying that regardless of what the mechanisms are, it is always going to be a, a multi-level cooperative? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I think what we found was that there are gaps in the use of current tools, like national policy statements, um, the regional rules would be another one that stand out. And I mean, I'm not the only one who's identified these. Um, your erstwhile um, QC in, in the city, um, Royden Somerville, did a very long dissertation on risk and the law and also pointed out the, these similar sorts of issues. Um, the, the, the question, I suppose, remains as to whether we have the right governance arrangements, and we're at risk of getting into that debate, which is pretty hot in Wellington at the moment. <laughs> um, there are some things that are better done at central government, and I think you could think about how central government responds to something that has widespread implications to people. So if you think of natural disasters, they've set up a system which cascades from the centre down to the, what is best done at the region and what's best done at the centre. If you get a big enough catastrophe, it all gets taken back to the centre. And you get a new institution set up, which is Sarah. And this happened, this, this isn't, that's not the first time that's happened in New Zealand. There's a tendency for, um, when big things happen for the centre to deal with them. And so you could, I suppose, pose the... Um, you, 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 you could think about if, if these climate changes were occurring all at the same time around the country, that the government would do something. In other words, it, but what it's doing in that circumstance is responding to a threat, not anticipating a threat. Okay, and so what this, what this is really about is to say that we know that the sea level is rising and we know that it will get to at least 30 centimetres, as Andy said. It, it will probably get more, likely to get more, at least to one metre by 2100. So that being the case, how do we organise ourselves better to do that at our various levels of government? And to do it adequately, there needs to be much stronger engagement with communities. So I suppose the question really is, given those conditions, how do you design your gov governance systems to be able to deal with those? And do we just rely on central government to pick up the pieces later, or do we anticipate that? Um, but I think if, if we think about the, um, the, the relative roles of regional and district councils, it, it, it seems to me that it makes sense for regional councils to be identifying um, 
the regional hazards and risks, and I know you've been doing that in this region, and other regions have been as well. Um, and then the local government is picking up the, the actual on the ground consenting process, etc. But one of the biggest one of the biggest barriers um, is actually the legal process itself, because it's actually forcing people to think about things in a certainty framework, and it's not entirely dealing with a risk management framework very well. So. You know, you could rewrite the law so that it could deal with that, but it needs a lot more discussion as to how you would actually do it. But there is work going on on that, and the, um, we've got Australian colleagues who are very actively looking at how the law operates there, where local government has no power at all and no money. <laughs> I mean, at least you've got the powers and the money here um, to be doing things. So I, I probably haven't quite answered your question, no, Dave. But just following on from that, I mean, I'm interested in how um, diplomatic and perhaps overly charitable you've been about the wider political context that you're presenting a lot of, I'll come to exactly what I mean, um, presenting a lot of sensible things, many of which this city certainly is already involved in. Um, but the irony of doing that in the context of um, no meaningful national or international efforts actually to reduce emissions and in fact what I would charitably describe as a New Zealand government that's completely AWOL on climate change issues. Um, it's, all very, it's all very ironic to suggest that this can all be done locally when you've already said right at the end of your presentation community pushback because people aren't convinced that it's real has been caused by the lack of government commitment. So how do you work your way through that problem in society? <laughs> Vote wisely. <laughs> but, but I think, I think, I think you know, governments come and go. That's always my, my, my take. Um, I don't know if any of you have re read um, Geoffrey Palmer's book, Reform, but it's, it's quite a good read, actually. Um, he made a comment in there which I thought was really good about how policy is never done. In other words, Policy evolves, you never have policy that doesn't continue to evolve. And so I suppose the answer would be that um, policies to deal with climate change will have their day. And I mean, you know, can't say anything else really. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I'm just wondering if part of the messaging that's really wrong about climate change, and not trying to tell you how to suck eggs, is I haven't heard you, any of you talk about the word opportunity today. And that is always opportunity. opportunity. It's always the other side of well, risk. Well, and yeah. and coming from middle March, I have to say that I think we're going to be better off. So I can say that. Um, but um, it's part of the planning talk going forward is not just to um, say we're going to have to retreat potentially, but it's what are the opportunities that come with that. And I I do think it's part of the messaging is that people are picking back because they think it's all negative. Yeah. Um, and I'm just wondering. I mean, agriculturally, we, I think there are some wins in there for some parts of New Zealand. We'll be growing possibly oranges and we'll have bananas in New Zealand. That's good for local food. Um, but, you know, I, I, and that's that messaging. I'm just wondering, is, it, is there any research going into that? Well, I, I, well I'll come to you in a minute. <laughs> there were actually some messages about opportunities in there. Um, because... You, well, you take, for example, moving, moving, a, moving a town, for example. Well, I'll give you an example. Tasman District. They've got a, a round the Mapu Peninsula. I don't know. Some of you probably go there for holidays. Um, there's a um, highly vulnerable, exposed, risk-prone <laughs> area. What they've done is they've identified other areas that can be developed, and so with with other opening up opportunities but they may not be the same people. So your situation in agriculture is, I mean, agriculture is really good at adapting. It has been, but you, you may find, you don't want to overplay it, because you may find that you're adapting to a short-term thing, but then it might become, even though you're going to be drier, you might get huge dumps of rain, which totally wipe you out. Oh, sorry, I'm exaggerating. I can see Andy getting nervous here. <laughs> yeah, so, so I think the issue is that we're quite well adapted to the current variability, but there's a question mark over how well adapted we are to increased variability. And so even, yeah, 
So that, that's part of it. But yes, I take your point that there are, op there are potential opportunities, um, but we have to just be a little bit careful about how we frame that. Um, I don't know if you want to add any opportunities for agriculture, Andy, working in that sector. Yeah, but I just to just agree that yes, we think there are some opportunities there, and I do call mainly sort of the you know, South Island, Lower South Island agriculture, um, forestry um, in, in many parts of the country. Simple things like, like reduced winter heating bills and electricity demand, therefore reduced you know reliance on large um, hydro dams and therefore less exposure to particularly dry years. Um, having said that, for agriculture, there's a lot of things that we know we don't know, and that could. Yeah been not so nice, so it's the increased pest survival mm -hmm. that we typically find much harder to model and therefore I think there's an inherent bias in agricultural models that they assume some things <coughs> will continue except that it's warmer. Mm -hmm. And that's not by and large how natural systems see the world, um, but that's how models see the world. So you've got to be careful, but, but yes, I mean these are, these are clear opportunities. I mean, I'd, I'd hate to be oranges growing, to growing them even, sorry, but <laughs> mm. <laughs> um, I mean, uh, the, 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 part of it goes back though to what Julie said about, you know, but also how we balance managing downside risk and upside opportunities. We tend to take an, an approach in New Zealand as in many other places where downside significant risks are managed by public and not involvement, whereas opportunities are left in the private sector mm -hmm. initiative, and that's possibly how it should be. Um, I haven't thought hard enough about it to have a strong view on that. But it is something where, you know, that I think there is a legitimate focus for a, for a you know, public organisation to look at the downside risks mm. with a greater emphasis than on the upside opportunities. But I completely agree as part of the overall messaging and engaging communities, it's important not to pretend that it's all, all going to be really, really bad because in some other areas it may not at all be, and it may be strictly positive. The other thing that I haven't mentioned that is really important to keep in mind is that our economic fortunes by and large depend very much on what the rest of the world does. And not just in terms of greenhouse gas emissions, but in, the, in terms of the particular policies and changing landscape, partially in response to climate change. From some modeling that I've been involved in, the, the implications of if the world at large were to take steps to reduce greenhouse gas emissions from agriculture would have such an impact on commodity prices that it would more than counteract the downside cost to New Zealand of us pricing our agricultural emissions, even though our emissions are a much higher percentage of our total activities than for most other countries. So it's that interplay. But you know, equally in a, in a world that fails to take collective action, trade barriers and which club you belong to may be far more important. So keeping that in mind is really important to fully understand the, the, the complex risk landscape with climate change rather than just a myopic focus, what's happening in my backyard, even though that's where you engage people but sort of the more you get to a decision making role, I think the more important it is to, at least in your, in, in your collective minds, to keep in mind that there's many other factors at play that, that come together in creating a, a risk profile. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you've had it before referring to the Yubakaya and the Ashley River. In the last 12 months, the Ashley has seen more substantial flooding than the Rakaia which is totally opposite to what you're predicting. Right? And you never had rain in the Ashley area like they've had in the last 12 months. I mean, the, the, the very short answer is I haven't looked at the record, so I can't really comment too, in too much detail. But the, the slightly longer answer is a single year, as I said before, doesn't tell you anything about climate change trends. It really, we tend to have such short, such short data records in New Zealand that every year, almost by definition, brings a new surprise because it's, it's a su substantial addition to our total data record. Um, but it also goes back to average runoff is quite different to flooding. You, you could have flooding in places where your average runoff goes down because it gets drier overall, but a warm atmosphere carries more moisture, and so it can dump that at much, much shorter notice. So it's, it's important not to confuse long-term trends in runoff, which is sort of the you know, annual average river flow, and the potential for flooding, which is what happens over the course of 48 hours, for example. Um, but you know, it, it goes back to you know, events in a single year don't tell you very much other than you've added a, a data point to your long-term or rather short-term data series. So.
Um, Judy, you talked about socialising communities, which I think is hugely important and often we don't get to do enough of, but um, have you got some examples or done any research on of good socialisation of communities on these kind of issues? Internationally or well, I, I mean, it's interesting because the Twin Streams one has actually been included in a um, major publication coming out of Australia on um, ways of you know, doing adaptation to climate change. Um, it was put together by some of the people that were involved and also the woman from um, Ministry of the Environment. And that was an, was an issue that where a whole lot of stars aligned effectively where there was funding available and where the community was involved, kids were involved, artists were involved, and all sorts of people were involved. And, so, and it was a sort of, almost like a community development sort of activity, actually. And, but there probably are other things. Yeah, you're, and you're, just you're sort of more aware of Judy something. is forgetting that she was actually a co-author on an important study that's not, not uninteresting for local government, because we've, we've tended to look not so much at adaptation to climate change, Sometimes out of a fear that it's sort of it's the you know sort of the avoids the doing the hard thing, the right thing, the sort of the Catholic punish yourself mm -hmm. thing, reducing greenhouse gas emissions <laughs> as an as an easy opt out. I, I come from Bavaria originally, so I know what Catholic upbringing means. <laughs> <laughs> um, but whereas a study that Judy did in again um, Lower Hutt showed that actually if you talk to people about impact and adaptation options that can actually increase their willingness to talk about greenhouse gas emissions mm -hmm. as part of an integrated response. So it's, it's, it's not like you're shooting yourself in the foot by talking about adaptation if you also have a lower carbon strategy. Mm -hmm. These, you know, there's research in that space isn't well developed. We could be doing, should be doing, in my view, a heck of a lot more. Um, but, but there is relevant stuff there that's, that's also important, I think. Yeah, and that, that particular piece of work was um, undertaken with the psychology department at Victoria University. And um, we teamed up with them, Andy and I, and, and we did, did, some, did some work with them so they, they could actually socialise, the, if you like, the, the, the various options around what different things could happen under different climate um, sea level rise. Um, and as a result of that, um, people were more willing to think about longer term things because you brought the impacts nearer to them, so it had more relevance to them in the near term. And uh, so there's quite a lot in the psychology space that, that can be done, but there, there is work going on. Um, the a number of the universities in Britain, um, Exeter in particular, are doing work which we're aware of, and they're people we're all connected to. So we will we can pull that material together, and, and it probably raises an issue which I'd like to ask the audience: is how do you like to receive your information? What sort of what sort of um, like we're doing research. Some of it has been peer reviewed and it's all in the um, IPCC report, but you guys don't often have time to go into the IPCC report and pull it out. Ha what sort of mechanism for having this information come to you? I mean, is it that we have to set up a blog and we have a little blog for local government to interact with us? You know, I'd be really interested to, to know how, you know, what's the most useful way to impart knowledge other than. No, two airheads standing up here talking to you. <laughs> well, two, airheads, two airheads standing up here talking to us is a good start to the conversation, yeah. actually. And, and, and the blog ultimately may be a way of carrying that on. Whereas if we hadn't had you here and hadn't met you, mm -hmm. um, we may not be interested in going looking at sure. the blog. So, yeah. good start. Yeah. It's really, I mean, it's great to see this being videoed. Is this video going to be available for others to watch? Because yes, that, well, it's, that, that's one of the things that's fine for us to be here. It's really, it got if, we can, if people are engaged to tell them to watch the video, because we don't do enough of that, yeah. um, keeping the message going and available for others who can't make it. Tony. Um, just in around slightly in terms of, um, I suppose, societal change, talk about a community change. In the amount of potential transformational change. I've got a sort of sense that you think we're going to need to make a transformational change, but we're often in the community change. Turning it around slightly, uh, research, what research has been done about what actually generates that transformational change in society? Because it strikes me that we're sort of locked into that process because it's easy to grapple with incremental change and protecting assets. If you look worldwide, even in New Orleans, a almost a cataclysmic event, but I understand we're still looking to rebuild New Orleans. In some states. Well, my short answer is Steve Jobs. <laughs> Steve Jobs? Yeah. Um, my lo slightly longer answer is um, leadership and people basically 
leading. Now, the, the question that, asks, that, that, in terms of where it's happened in the, in the world, that sort okay. of transformation and change, the research around what's led yeah, to okay, it, because okay. it strikes me that yep. for many, in a, in a, from a political point of view and from a societal point of view, sometimes we need some sort of cataclysmic major event but That's before right. it generates that change. Just interested in elsewhere, where there has been a transformation, what have been the drivers that have allowed them to get to that point? Well, my, if, you, if you go to the research about round transformation and change, most of it is, as you've explained, that there will be a catastrophic shock. People will respond to a shock. Um, most of the research that's been done around transformation and change has come out of the decision making and around technology. And a lot of it, I have to say, has been done in the Netherlands, um, in Germany. I'm just thinking of a few particular pieces of work. And the, there is only just now starting to be research as it relates to climate change and drawing from that um, literature into the climate change literature and to think about what might it take. And most of it is around um, connection with communities, um, leadership, um, reflexive learning, that sort of learning cycle, how people learn and the building from that, that comes out of education literature um, primarily. And so it, it, it's around that area, but it's very much a, um, transformational research has not been done much in the climate change sphere, but it's been done in other areas and mainly that sort of technology change. Is there anything you can think of, Andy? That in terms of what you saw in the IPCC, because some of there is some transformational stuff referred to in chapter 25 and some of the yeah, other chapters. Yeah. I mean, it, uh, I think Julia's right in the sense that there isn't, hasn't been a lot of work been done in the climate change plus transformation space, mm -hmm. and most of the transformations that we've seen were driven by cataclysmic events. I mean, if you just look across the Tasman, major bushfires led to a major inquiry after the 2009 Black Saturday change in, in planning laws for flooding after the major, major Queensland flood events. So it does tend to be there. Um, I, I mean, but another example, again from Australia, reform of planning in the Murray-Darling Basin for water resource allocation, water trading, etc. I mean, it was driven by an increasingly severe resource shortage, but not by a cataclysmic event. So sometimes you can simply have a confluence of political will but I think also you need sort of ownership of, the, of, of a challenge you need to solve by more than one agent. So it can't be just government, it needs to at least industry or, or the actual community on board to, to come together. And it's usually, I mean, it sort of comes down to how you achieve change with anybody. You know, people have to, have to be able to see where to go rather than just be driven by a problem. Otherwise, they just you know, raise the barriers and, and sort of retreat to the trenches after that. I, I, I think there's lots of generic lessons, but nothing terribly particular to climate change in, in that space. Yeah, the, the, there is one example in New Zealand, which um, some of us are old enough to remember, uh, where we had a massive governance, political, social change um, when Muldoon was voted out. And I use that as a bit of an analogy to unpack what was going on and what happened. In other words, the time, time was right for change. And that had widespread implications, downside and upside, to the New Zealand economy, to people, etc. And the Resource Management Act came out of that. And so that's a sort of a very local example where quite transformational change occurred in New Zealand, whatever you might think of it. Um, as a result of a number of factors, some of which were political, some of which were, um, well, they mostly were political and economic, um, and a realisation that we had to do things differently to be able to survive in the modern world. And um, so th those are, you know, we've done it before, and in some respects climate change is probably more complex, in that particular situation where there were two or three factors. <coughs> yeah, and, and it's basically the external yeah. pressure doesn't tend to come, come on that quickly other than from individual extreme events. Yeah. But it's, it's hardly ever a good process to wait for a, for a disaster to strike, mm -hmm. to make a change. Um, but ma ma maybe one other thing that's worth adding, but maybe that's reflecting more 
how academic community is catching up with reality. It's, it, might, it won't be novel to anybody in this room mm -hmm. that community-based decisions are driven by values. Mm -hmm. And historically, people dealing with climate change, strategic processes, have tended to assume adaptation is sort of a self-runner that's driven by the collective self-interest and it's sort of kind of a free market approach and therefore adaptation will deliver the optimum adapted outcome at any one point in time. And of course that's you know, that's not true otherwise we wouldn't see flood images right now from one in 20 year events because nobody wants to be flooded. But so what, where I think people are catching up in that space is that they increasingly realize how much <coughs> adaptation outcomes and constraints on adaptation options are contingent on differing societal values. Where you, I mean, you really can't say whether one or the other value sort of should or shouldn't be there. It's, it's just important to recognize that and to recognize that you know, this is a values-driven process and the more one can reflect it proactively and, and use it to engage rather than to alienate, it's probably an important part to enable a conversation, even just to understand better why somebody, you know, is just such a beep and just doesn't agree with me. Um, We've tended to have quite a simplistic view of adaptation processes, at least in the literature, and I'm you know, saying really the academics have been slow in catching up with, oh, that's the real world. But I think that hopeful fusing of lessons from the academic literature into decision practice can benefit from a quite you know, explicit recognition of the value-based processes, which we know well exists for choices to reduce greenhouse gas emissions or not. But we're less, much less keenly aware of that in the adaptation space and what type of adaptation actions we actually prefer and which parts of the community actually are prepared to go along with certain things, whether you value you know, property prices, beach amenity, ecosystems, flexibility for the next generation as compared to the current generation. All these are essentially values and people take different stances on those. Just one example of, of what Wellington City Council has done, some of you might be aware of this, but um, they got Tonkin and Taylor to do a report for them around the sort of risks in the um, Wellington region and they also asked at the same time to identify <coughs> what were the values that were at stake. Now I think that report's now been released, so I think it's on their website if you're interested in having a look at it. Now look, it wasn't the final answer or anything, but it was a step along the way through um, one officer really asking the question and defining the terms of reference and, and it actually put a whole lot new information on the table for councillors. To, to, to look at not just the, the fiscal risks, but what the values were that were at stake. And so, you know, this is why I come back to this idea of it, there's a lot of sharing that can be going on around the, um, around the country, and I know Maria's hooked into that group who do share this information, but it seems to me that we need to have that information more widely accessible to people in a form that can be really useful. Because, you know, the rubber hits the road at your table. <laughs> and that, that you've got to be confident that you've got the community um, who can relate to those values that you're expressing through your decision making. So, um, you know, I think some, some, some little baby steps are starting to be taken and it will gain traction. Yeah. Can I just put up where we spin on that sort of thing uh, mm -hmm. in terms of using those sort of community values and things? Because, you know, I, um, so we seem to go into sort of going around the communities and talking about hazards and you. In your last slides, you said sort of some of the things that aren't such good tools are drawing lines on maps and things. Like you said, you've got lots of lines and lots of maps. Um, and, 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 and your next slide said that one of the best things for transformational change was engaging with communities. Now, I know that when, when, when that community engagement takes place, vested interest is what's going to drive it. Um, and that's one of the things that you'll have to change. And I wondered, perhaps, you had that timeline of sort of decisions and planning and time frames. If you take the average age of a property owner in a community of Dunedin and how long their vested interest mm. in that property mm. will be, mm. it's getting down to it's one of the really short, short. It's not quite as short as a three-year electrical, uh, ele electrical <laughs> cycle, <laughs> but, but it's, it's, it's getting down there. You know, yeah. You're talking only two or three decades. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's one of the things that you need to um, look at if you're going to affect this transformational change. Mm. And unless you put a line on the map that constrains some of those people from doing what they want to do in their 30 year um, time frame. Now, I, I have no expectation that my children or my grandchildren will be on the same property that I'm on, yeah. which is different now to what it might have been 
you know, 100 years ago, where you had intergenerational use of land, we don't have more that's very much current as the interest. Which links so nicely to that question of opportunity, actually, because uh, the conversation in Wellington around the business cycles in the CBD that would be affected by sea level rise, for example, you know, and this guy who owned a, a property was saying, you know, well, I, I'm in and out, you know, over a period of maybe 10, 15 years or less, as the case may be. The question, I suppose, arises as to whether those are actually those nodes on the map that are the decision points where, when people move, whether there's an opportunity for information to inform their choices. In other words, you, you, may, you, you may want to sell your house, I don't know where you live, but if, if, if say for example... Above 100 metres. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, the information would be available so that people actually know, make a considered choice about whether they want to buy your place. And then the question arises, well, what, what do I do about that? How do I recognise my value, the value in my property? And, you know, it's a bigger question. Much bigger question. I'm not sure if humans are that rational, quite frankly, because look at the boom in yeah. shorefront property a few years back at the same time as the world was beginning to wake up to sea level rise. Mm. Um, but it, it didn't change it. People still said it's desirable for me to live on the seashore, you know, with, you know, um, for, for, the, for the next 20 years. You know, it's not going to happen in my time. Then. Yeah, but look, I'll give you an example. Ramati South, where you're, I know quite well, some of you may know it. You've got some beautiful homes on top of a sand dune. They are relocatable. They've been told they have to build them relocatable. And the beach in front of them is, frankly, naff. Awful. It's, it's like a flat thing with a great big sort of revetment, vertical revetment. And because of that, the sea just keeps the beach wet. And so you have no dry sand at any time of the year, pretty much now, in front of those houses. And so the amenity that you've gone there to live for changes. And so that will start to get people thinking. And having talked to some of the people who live up there, they're all aware of the problem. And they actually realise that their children probably will not be living there at all. And they don't, won't want them to, but they'll live out the life of that building. But there's nothing out there saying to them, well, what's the option? How can we think about moving? And some of the Kapiti people have been talking to community groups about looking at what's the long term. Could there be land zoned further up the hill that could be for new development? And that you get a staged retreat out of that area. And so it's having that conversation with the community that's actually starting to raise the consciousness of those people, even though some of them are still going to court or have gone to court over the um, information that was provided. So I think there are little chinks of um, levers in there that can be started by councils by having those conversations and they tend to snowball in the community because each community group will hear that the other's doing it and they want a bit of the action. So, you know, that's what people do. We learn from our peers, you know, our neighbours and so forth. Anyway, that's... Now, look, I'm very conscious that uh, yeah, sorry, you're, sorry. you're heading for the university to get a... a Oh, yeah, uh, yeah. Presentation yeah. there, so I'm, I'm sorry there were other questions, but we'll pull it to a halt here. Can I thank you for your presentation? Uh, you took it, it it's extraordinarily complex, but you canvassed um, various facets that took us well beyond uh, arguing about whether the science is wrong or not, uh, which, is, which, uh, which I'm, I'm, I thank you for. It was really useful. And can I just say that we will look forward to future interactions. Um, this is really um, positive stuff and it's, it's an area that we know council will have to go and we will have to be talking to our community as you say in that. So it's, uh, it was really good to get, a, to get a start from you in that presentation. So thank you very much.